everyone. Welcome to the Charvak Podcast. This is your host Kushal Mehra. All right, today's podcast is titled "Freedom of Speech and Expression: History, Legality, Philosophy, and the Future." And to chat about that, I have Nikhil Mehra with me. Nikhil, thanks for coming. Thanks for having me. This should be a lot of fun. All right. So before we start, you know, before I get Nikhil to uh, start explaining how. just to give a brief background so this podcast was planned for a long long time and you know we we took a lot of time to get to this discussion is because we wanted to do a comprehensive discussion so uh, this is not for the faint hearted because this is going to be a la- long discussion so iske pehle ki somebody comes and says why are discussion so long this is going to be a long discussion so if you can't handle it by main kuch nahi kar sakta secondly you're, this is going to be you are making promises on behalf of me that i may not be able to keep so i'm just letting you know in advance tu gir jayega beech mein koi baat nahi tere ko udhar se chapad maar ke wapas jaga denge tere girne ki baat nahi hai yaar to necessarily itna kuch kehne ke liye nahi hai kya kare apne desh mein aise hi chalta hai yaar free speech hai kabhi thele pe dalo kabhi yahan le jao kabhi wale yeah that's true that's true but so the so we we wanted to structure it in a particular way where we not only talk about specific cases but we talk about the background of how free speech evolves what is it conceptually what are the philosophical roots behind it then maybe we use certain legal standards in india and then we compare it to maybe global standards and then we talk about which is going to be the the future of free speech in india or and, and its potential impacts so having laid out the plan abhi nikhil i give it over to you now you take it over <laughs> right so uh, you know i uh, it's a very odd place to sort of start but i want to start on the issue of free speech as if nothing existed right there is no constitution there are no rules there is no understanding of what the right ought to be what it isn't and we sort of have to accept that maybe in the west through a very tenuous link a lot of academics tend to draw the roots of free speech all the way back to ancient greece uh a trial that was against socrates for example the ability uh, the greek democracies in the sense that within democracies anything could be said especially during campaigns uh election campaigns uh but it's fairly tenuous to say that any of that constituted free speech now the most basic thing that i look at right is what distinguishes human beings from animals amongst many other things is the ability to have a complex language right so we are able to use sounds in a complex manner in a way in which other creatures are not such that we are able to detect more than other creatures i wouldn't say to the total exclusion of all other animals but more than other animals a variance in intonation that will help us to comprehend different meanings for possibly the same sounds so the same word can have completely different meanings but you are able to detect that understanding based on the intonation of the speaker this to me is the most fundamental aspect of speech right and if that is what exists as a natural position of human beings then the ability to express there from use that high levels of complexity that our minds permit is a fundamental aspect of the existence of human beings so it's why do i raise it in this manner i am only trying to point out that the ability to effect speech the ability to speak in a particular way to to use the words that you wish wish to use is an inherent trait of human beings right <clears throat> and this is really not too dissimilar to how this, the journey of free speech as a legal right also originated not merely originated but progressed because truly speaking it came from the concept of natural rights and this is why as you see that distinction growing and developing certain societies developed this right while their own societies were 
struggling with and understanding the concept of natural rights. And certain other societies, much like ours, accepted this right as handed down in colonial contexts. And so there is a very different set of societal tools for being able to accept and to allow for the prospering of the right to free speech. The societies are very different from each other. And because they're different, sometimes they have big variances in how they approach this right. Even though it is a human right, and it is therefore supposed to be fairly evenly applied across the world, it having been accepted in various international governments, including the U Universal Declaration of Human Rights, the ICCPR, etc. However, how society is applied can also can vary quite severely. So, in terms of sort of a, a historical idea, like I said, human beings have always had the ability to speak, and so therefore speak in ways that is different from other animals. And that's an inherency. That inherency gains some kind of propagation ability with the advent of publication. So the first publication that occurred was in 1476. I'm talking about after Gothenburg, but in England, mm -hmm. William Caxton set up the first public publication, which is the first printing press in 1476 and published the first book. And pretty much when his first book was out, the church, the state, everybody jumped on it. Absolutely everybody. Because they could foresee right away trouble is around the corner. Once human beings can start publishing the words that they want, suddenly that power and authority and that total control over knowledge that these large superstructures within the state possessed, that was compromised. And that is the first underpinning of the philosophical basis of free speech. Well, the second, the first is it's in inherent in you by the very fact that you're human, that your, com your complex brain and your complex speech boxes allow you to speak in a way other animals cannot and to, to put together and string together complex words and complex ideas. Mm. And the fact that that inheres in you is sufficient in my, in my understanding for it to be a natural right. One, two, once the power of publication arises, the ability to spread that word obviously manifests itself. So if you look at the right to free speech, look at it in three elements. And these three elements have over time been accepted in judgments. One is in four elements. One is the most nascent stage, which is when you are when when the idea is only a part of your conscience. And that is a liberty of conscience, a freedom of conscience, to be able to think what you wish to think. Right? So there are no thought crimes. Hmm. And this needed individual protection in the law in itself, because the idea, the ability to hold an idea in itself is what was being challenged by the powers that be throughout the medieval, medieval ages. Yeah. Right? So that's step one. Then the next step is discussion. You bring that idea out and vocalize it. And once you vocalize that idea, you now have entered the realm of discussion. You've exposed others to this idea. And once you've exposed others to this idea, you are also on the pathway to what is called as advocacy, because you may be asking them to think about the idea somewhat differently. And finally, look at the last element, which is incitement. And over time, we'll see that the first two stand protected and the, the first three stand protected. And it's only the idea of incitement that becomes actionable. Right? So, I spoke about 1476 being the first year in which a printing press was established in England and, and mm -hmm. the first book was published. Right? So, this is around the time at which, as we move down a timeline of sort of free speech will tell you, Books are being published in 1476, but the Magna Carta had already come in 1215. So the concept of rights within man is now starting to take much deeper root. Before that has actually been fleshed out into any kind of theory, the progress on the tech side has already been made because the publication has arrived. Right? 
And as this moves on, uh, there are various public, there are various plays written, various uh, publications of different sorts written by different philosophers, by different authors, all of which are now moving to the idea that in a free state, the ability to speak should be free. Right? Now, as this progresses, we now come to the 1600s and the 1700s, which is really sort of enlightenment kicking in in a big way, right? And you have the theory of Hobbes, Locke, Rousseau, and Locke in particular inspires a lot of what follows thereafter. Right? The Bill of Rights. Locke is the modern father of the Bill of Rights. Because what did he say? He said that there is a social contract and in exchange for that, for, the, for what the state offers in terms of security, the basic Lockean state of providing security, of satisfying your contracts and protecting your property. Hmm. Right? That basic Lockean state, you adhere to that state in exchange for giving away certain rights. But that has a counterfactual which is that inherently, therefore, there are certain inalienable rights you have not given up. Mm -hmm. Conscience being one of them, the ability to speak being one of them, the ability to express your ideas being another one. Right? And as this sort of ideas sort of progress from lock downward, uh, you have the 17th century Dutch philosopher Benedict uh, the Spinoza, whose philosophy was well known in the colonies and he believed in the liberty of speech was based upon an indefeasible natural right of individuals. And this, this statement is what sort of starts recurring. So now a free speech right exists. What contours it will take, we're still, we're still seeing because these theories are developing. But the primacy of that right can now not be questioned. Right? And this is how the Anglosphere develops. As enlightenment progresses, as their notion of free speech, as, as their notion of rights and natural rights inherent in man progress, free speech is an imperative right within that. Right? And it's a very interesting analysis because Nietzsche often captures these things so brilliantly. Right? So Nietzsche, Nietzsche, for example, had highlighted this enlightenment period and, and basically called it as a, there is a genealogy of morals, an essay that he wrote called The Genealogy of Morals. Right. So what he essentially said was the Enlightenment era was the replacement of the morals of the past by the morals of the future, by those who were always subject, who were slaves in a sense to those past morals. Their resentment against those past morals is what brought about the Enlightenment so that they could replace those past morals with new morals. And these new morals were about the inherency of these rights within humanity. Right? So this is really the philosophical underpinning of where it, it stems from in the first instance. Why it is necessary, we keep progressing and we see, keep seeing why the various justifications why free speech is so necessary, keep evolving and keep becoming more and more robust. But as I said, Locke was a very important factor and Locke inspired Thomas Jefferson. Right? Got it. But the history of free speech, whether it is an ancient history of free speech or a modern history of free speech, is littered with hypocrisy. When you are outside of power, free speech is the most important thing. Once you are inside power, curtailing it is the most important thing, managing it is the most important thing. And it will shock you. It goes in cycles. Exactly the games that they were playing back in the 1700s when the American state, the US state was being formed, are the games that are being played in 2020 and 2021 in India. You know, so if you say something against a particular politician, they find a way to, to come after you. Exactly the same games go on. Right? But there are more protections now. That's the difference. Anyway, let me, let me yeah, sort of... Just, just to add a bit in the historical bit and uh, India's uh, contribution to... This, albeit indirect, so in the Natya Shastra, in one of the opening 
uh, statements. Uh, so the date of the Natya Shastra, there are debates whether it's 200 BCE or 200 CE. There is a specific case where you know there is a play happening and uh, the Devas are basically taking the Mickey out of the Asuras and the Asuras go and complain that nahi chalega, nahi chalega. And then you know I I remember a specific play, a specific thing. I'm going to read it. This is from the Open Magazine. Indra steps in scattering the malevolent spirits, impeding the performance, but the matter ends up before Brahma. How can we endure an enactment of our humiliation, the Asura's art? Brahma instructs them to adopt a distance view of art, drawing lessons from the action and being entertained instead of taking things personally. He explains that the world is full of stories and some will be told from an Asura point of view and the others from opposing one, but all offer some form of edification. He also issues instructions on how playhouses will be guarded by the gods in the future, a necessary provision since it's unclear if the argument is in favor of free expression has convinced the Asuras. This no, is not a It's very interesting you brought that up. I specifically didn't bring that up because I don't consider that reference to constitute historical roots for free speech in India. Because no, I get it. Right, because it doesn't extend to individuals. It doesn't extend to people outside. It's only for groups. Right. One particular context, it doesn't step outside of that. It's not as if there are kingdoms that are saying vibrant free speech is the most important thing. Sure, art is expressed. There are patrons of art. There are patrons of all kinds of art for that matter. Mm -hmm. And, uh, you know, notions of obscenity, etc. are varied. But it is difficult to say that there is no arbitrariness for when a king might decide, oh, no, 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 now I've heard enough, you're, you're gone for this. <laughs> right? So, I, I don't really look at that as much roots. I, I look at what are our constitutional structures today and our constitutional structures today, whether in India or anywhere else, don't really draw from any medieval history in India or any ancient history in India. Uh, maybe that's a point of research for us to do. Must be that there are plenty of kings in the past who looked at art as something divine and looked at it as something to be protected to the degree to which an artist's voice cannot be altered. Right? So there may be good examples of this. And we must have lost a lot of great examples in the great libraries that we lost. Mm -hmm. But uh, I have not in, in my study of free speech ever found India to be a reference point from a pure philosophical standpoint on a definition of free speech or on the expansion of the right. See, as far as India's free speech is concerned, there are only two examples that are always gotten. One is this, Natya Shastra, and the other is actually not very good for free speech, or, uh, the Manusmriti one, Satyam Bhriyat, Priyam Bhriyat, that one. That is uh, speaking the truth and truth with certain caveats. So, I mean, there are two versions of it. That These are the two most famous versions in it. But again, uh, like rights consciousness, as we understand today from a constitutional perspective, is a very different concept, let's say, in comparison to how civilizations before this have come. Like, I just finished this beautiful book on laws and how they evolved. And what I found very interesting was in the evolution of laws is whether it was the Mesopotamians, whether the Chinese and whether the Indians, right? The three oldest uh, lawmakers, because... Uh, a lot of laws that are developed later on, whether it's the Romans and all of them, they, they build on all these three civilizations. Let, uh, I mean, that is the take of the author in that book. So what is interesting there is the that the previous three generations where, okay, China is a very, you know, top down, very authoritarian. India is more obsessed with duties and maintaining the cosmic order, which is through dharma. And uh, obviously, you had Hammurabi's code and stuff like that. But they were very duties obsessed society. They were not. They, they, it's not that they did not have a rights conception, but it was very little. Or it may well have because we we don't really know how everyday society worked, right? We don't really know how it operated because what they may have may, what they may have felt is rights are inherent. Rights are going to be exercised all the time. The duties are what need enumeration. Right? That's so a very we don't good really point. Know, we don't really know how that that operates because. I tend to not have a very negative view of the ancient world, having looked at what the ancient world achieved and what we lost for a thousand years in between, right? For a thousand or more years in between. So I, I don't know what it would be, but my, my short point was, if I am placing philosophically free speech as a natural right, so therefore not requiring any sanction, not requiring any rules, not requiring anybody's permission, 
then where I place it is really in the Enlightenment era. And, and in, in that sense, the question will always be, qua free speech, qua other rights, how deep and how far has Enlightenment traveled? Even in today's day and age. And if it hasn't traveled far and deep enough, then we're going to see rights being curtailed and people not having a problem. So, so what do you, uh, I have to ask this question because I think it makes perfect sense that now that you've said, so, so bear with me. So in, in that is in that kind of a scenario today, you know, we have this discussion on removing the colonial roots of our, uh, out of our constitution. And um, if that is the scenario, what if somebody would say uh, that this, this, over obsession on rights itself is a colonial way of looking at things, and we what should maybe balance it with a... saying it. Yeah, <laughs> what somebody, huh? what somebody, prime minister is saying it. Yeah, I mean, and we should think about it from a duties based perspective. So, so what do we do then? Now, look, like I said, you can if you do a duties based perspective, you need a different system of lawmaking. Today, your lawmaking system. Re- the way it's set up, you have to enumerate rights and you have to enumerate duties. Right? So if you're going to go to a duties-based system, then you have to say rights is everything else. Absolutely everything else. And otherwise, we are only enumerating duties or we're pinpointing duties. This idea that duties exist uh, and that they are they interpret rights or that directive principles of state policy exist and they interpret rights is absolutely not new. Let me be clear about this. This has been done by the Supreme Court itself repeatedly in various judgments. And I would argue to bad effect, to very bad effect. It is almost always biased towards the state. This may be one aspect of us. Maybe in India, and I, I mean, you know, this is one of the conclusions that, what conclusions? I was going to show you how free speech sort of, this, this entire primordial system of natural rights that I was devolving was saying, this is why in the Anglosphere, free speech is a much more cherished right, much more protected right. And the approach of judges to how free speech cases to be argued. I mean, there are passages I will read to you from Brandenburg versus Ohio, which to me are the highest level to which a judge has ever interpreted free speech, in my opinion. And I will show you contrasting judgments from Indian Supreme Court, where it's a fairly high level, but it is not the level of enlightenment that you will see in Brandenburg versus Ohio. Right? Where a judge himself looks at his own limitations and says, why should I be allowed to exercise these limitations at all? Not a question but that we are frequently used mm-hmm. to asking ourselves in this country. Basically, dil dukhane wali baat hai. Mother, theek hai. You go ahead. Now I'll not bother you for another 10 minutes. What I'm saying is now, now you have you have Locke, you have Hobbes, Locke, Rousseau, you have Spinoza, you have this, uh, this idea has taken root. Right? In this time, Galilee, Galileo Galilei has come. This is in Italy, in, in Italy and he has suffered and that sufferance has caused a huge amount of problem. Martin Luther has come and gone, you know, so the old structures are falling apart. And this like, this is why I said Nishi looked at all of this and said, this is really a deep resentment within the slaves of the old morality who now want to break down that old morality and replace it with a new morality. And the effective replacement of that new morality was so strong, so powerful because it was based in natural rights. And that, I would argue, has not stayed altered for a 600-year period. And there are very few rights doctrines that last 600-year periods. You've read the book on the history of laws in general. 600 years is a pretty long time for a system that takes power away from the state to have lasted and to have prospered. Oh, I agree. Partic- I mean, obviously, I'm not saying this is true in every single country. In fact, my entire argument is that it can't be true in every single country because every single country evolved a little differently, right? But in India, as is our best tradition, we take the best from the rest of the world. So we did take a lot from the rest of the world. And we've got this sort of hybrid system and what we can do to improve upon it and make it better. That's a part of the discussion today, right? So, <coughs> sorry, this is going to keep happening because... I would like it known to the world that Kushal Mehra has driven me to madness to do this podcast today, despite the fact that I'm still not fully recovered from COVID. Sharam Kirk, like COVID. 
All right, so William Caxton comes along. He publishes a book, and like I said, every power structure element over there is like, boss, this is going to be difficult for us because you never now you don't know what a guy can publish, what he can write, and how far he can go, and how far he can go is everything, right? Because maintaining the flock, maintaining people in a state of mindlessness, where whatever you say to them, whatever you hand down to them, is everything for them. That's an imperative part of maintaining power. So what do the Brits do? The Brits are masters above everything else. The Brits are masters at one thing. Kushal, can you name that one thing? Colonizing people. <laughs> well, how? They are the masters of bureaucracy, man. Bureaucracy comes before anything else, right? So they set up what were called a stationers' company. A stationers' company was essentially a licensure body. For anybody who had to publish, had to first go get a license from the stationers' company, right? But it's the sort of thing which is very odd, and I don't understand why this happened. This comes about almost immediately with the publication of the first book in 1476, and in about 200 years, the concept dies, and it doesn't die because of some great debate and some great pushback. Though that may well be the case, it just dies by lapse. The legislation simply lapses, and it's gone. Right, but it's never reintroduced, so there must have been enough pushback. Right? But what does the idea of stationers' company create? It creates the idea of pre-censorship, right? And as pre-censorship is emerging, there are ideas against it. Define pre-censorship, please. Define pre-censorship. Like we will define the idea that can gain publication before it is published. And if it is an idea that is deemed not worthy by the state of publication, it cannot be published. That's precise. Third sentiments, right? <clears throat> it's it's the modern the modern version of that would be the censor board in regard to film yeah. or in regard to anything else, right? That's that's a that's a stationer's company for the modern world for the modern world of film. Anyway, so the stationer's company exists. And uh, they could sole discretion, no question of challenging anything, no question of going to courts, nothing, right? Now, at this time, Thomas, and, and, and there's something very interesting going on. Throughout the 1600s and the 1700s, America is certainly an English colony across the pond, as it were. But the development of law is parallel to each other. Both countries are developing law together. Things move very quickly, in fact, even in the US. And when Thomas Jefferson is thinking about drafting the Bill of Rights, the person he is most influenced by is Locke. But mm -hmm. Locke is a philosophical underpinning. Locke doesn't give you a legal text. Right? So where does a legal text come from? And the person who is the most important definer of the scope, the legal, the scope of the legal right of free speech that emerges is a guy called Blackstone. Lawyers who are watching or those who generally read the law will know of something called Blackstone's, Blackstone's Law Dictionary. You'll find this online as well. He's the most important definer of things in the law, in the common law in particular. So Blackstone comes up with his own definition and Blackstone makes it very particular to say Pre-censorship can't exist. The word cannot be stopped at the time at which it is spoken. But once it is spoken, the speaker must live by the temerity of his words. Right? In other words, no pre-censorship, but yes, subsequent punishment possible. And these are not parliaments. These are not... Uh, again, I keep coming back to that. These are not parliaments. These are not lawmaking bodies of any other sort, not even small group-based lawmaking bodies that are making these kind of, that are putting these kinds of ideas out there and they are just readily being accepted because that's the time, that's the nature. And I just want to emphasize this. It's enlightenment. People are taking on new errors. Nishi, as he says, the old morality is now going to be replaced. That new morality is being defined. And there is no centralized body that's going to define this new morality. There are a bunch of great thinkers that are going to define this morality. It is the most libertarian of times in that sense. Right? And so what does he define? He says, there are certain natural limitations to speech. 
And one of them that comes with sedition. That's the big public law one. Obviously, licentious speech and libel. Libel and slang. Right? So these are the big core elements. And if you were to have laws that only have these three restrictions, you would have the broadest possible free speech right. Because there is no free speech right ever conceived that I have found of that doesn't at least have these restrictions, these, these restrictions having been accepted even when we were in a primordial defi definitional stage of what free speech would be. Right? And there are very important distinctions because the nation state is also developing at the same time. And the nation True. state very is, good point. is seen as the vehicle of the best possible vehicle for the effectation of rights. Over time, the nation state is the worst vehicle as well. But in a larger <laughs> sense, the nation state is the best vehicle for the effectuation of rights. And when it comes to liberal and slander, that's a case of competing rights. Isaiah Berlin, at one point in time, wrote the seminal paper on negative rights versus positive rights. Right? You can't hurt my right in exercising your right. And that's liberal. Right? Mm -hmm. So, Thomas Jefferson has is, is privy to all of these ideas. He's understood all of these ideas, right? And he's, he's based in Virginia, and he urges the state courts to use state sedition laws against his political opponents. So, in, in the meantime, they pass this Aliens and Sedition, uh, Alienation and Sedition Act. And one of the clauses of it is, you will not bring the government of the day in disrepute. Uh, and what he does in the Virginia legislature in 77 is to pass a bill requiring loyalty oaths. Now, what are these loyalty oaths? The purpose of which was to punish a person who was a traitor in thought but not in deed. Right? In his endeavor, he, this was also, he had also support, he also had the support of George Washington. So your founding fathers of the United States, who we uphold as being those who push this right as far as possible, and not just this liberty, but so many other liberties, they went through their process of, yeah, well, maybe not. You know? And as always, politics is what, politics is the divining rod that causes everything to sort of fall into two halves, right? Now, politics is going to take over. You have to choose whether you want to be on this side or on that side. And what happens is in 1798, the Federalist government of the United States passes four related pieces of legislation known as Alien and Sedition Acts, which were reminiscent of British laws prescribing seditious libel. Section 4 prescribes speech that would bring even Congress or the President into disrepute. Right? So institutions acting to protect them or their own selves against words. This is so, so much like India today. <laughs> exactly, right? Now, that's exactly what I know. This is somewhat similar to the kinds of arrests we've seen in India when comments are made against politicians and they find some little... And what do they find as well? They always find the same section to go after people, which is public order. Oh, yes. Right? Now, Jefferson, this is 1798. In 1800, Jefferson is fighting for the 1800 election, right? Now he needs votes. And now when you need votes, you need the citizens to speak up for you. And if you want citizens to speak up for you, you have to speak up for the citizens. This is why I was saying politics is what sorts everything out. And this is why I was trying to point out all of this development of natural rights. These, this is being spread all over America. It's western, it's the western part of America, the United States, through pamphlets, through books, through ideas that are coming from Britain, from Europe in general, through ships that are coming, such that the cultural tools necessary for accepting and for promoting free speech are getting embedded within the population itself. Right. So, Thomas Jefferson. Having done all of this Alien and Sedition Act and saying Congress and President itself, you can't, you can't say anything against. When he fights the 1800 election, he fights it on the platform of no free speech has to be complete. 
and arguably that one position helps him win a very narrow narrow election and when he comes for the inauguration date the inauguration date in the us has always been unchanged 20th january uh, of the following year so 20th january 1801 when he comes for inauguration he makes a profound speech and a resounding speech in support of free speech right and for a hundred odd years the united states has a very high standard of free speech but not quite the first amendment standard that you see today despite the fact that the mm. first amendment came to be passed and it again is. i come back to this natural rights concept and it's very very basic for this understanding in the united states the liberty clauses of the first amendment were passed before the equality clauses of the 14th amendment <coughs> by a period of 60 odd years right that's what natural that's what a nation birthed in the concept of natural rights values more and when i'm saying all of this keep an idea in your head about what your nation is today and what the contrast would look like and why therefore whatever you do a 153 and a 295a aren't that easy to get rid of right So the cultural tools, because you you described it perfectly earlier, these were duty based systems. So the cultural tools for the expansion of rights simply didn't exist. And cultural tools, if they exist within the culture, so therefore within the citizenry, they will play out in the politics. And the first time I'm asking Thomas Jefferson goes for an election, and he has to abide by this idea of natural rights, right? So. this is this is how sort of the free speech right comes into force in the us just just one one argument i think we should add we should also say why john stuart mills uh, you know arguments in favor of uh, freedom of speech so okay. if, I, i was uh, going to come to that i was going to come to yeah, that yeah the trident you know, this, i think the trident is very important so the, 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 no, no, this is this is this comes See, I'm, I'm I'm still drawing out a a chronology. Mill still hasn't mm. spoken. Yeah, right. We're still in the late 1700s and 1800s. Mill still hasn't said anything. Mm-hmm. The great essay on liberty comes later, mm-hmm. 1859, if I'm not mistaken. Mm, I'm not good with dates. Yeah, yeah. On liberty is 1859. 1859 is seminal year. I was going to come to that. It's going to be a central theme of what I'm going to talk about. Sure, right. go ahead. But Voltaire has come mm-hmm. in 1770, and Voltaire, that famous statement of his, that which he said to uh, one of his colleagues, "I detest what you write, but I would give my life to make it possible for you to continue to write." And that's the kind of dedication to this idea and to this notion that is. acquiring very deep societal roots and that's a commitment to rights that's necessary if you want rights to be perpetuated lamenting about them off and on won't work right it has to be a part of your cultural set yeah yeah in india and, people are totally committed in the other say they only are only committed in suppressing everything they don't like to hear so so we'll come to that and and i'll come to why i think that happens also so this is why i'm trying to draw out the way one nation is developing the anglosphere is developing how we will go of course we have a link with the anglosphere because of because of colonialism but how did that link play out right so we'll see uh 1789 the us declaration of rights of man is sorry the the french declaration of rights of man after the french revolution are released us constitution is already in place in 1791 possibly affected by how strongly worded the free speech right was in the french declaration in 1791 the american constitution sees its first amendment and this first amendment was shunted around prior in various senates important senates at that time and congresses at that time for example in virginia and in and in other states where it it, it took ma- various forms But one of the phrases that used to come repeatedly which didn't actually find its way into the text was that free speech is the bulwark of the of the republic right and so eventually in 1791 you get a first amendment right which says congress shall make no law 
abridging the freedom of speech and that of, of its citizens and that of the press. The press is specifically mentioned. Another omission in our rights doctrine. Not a great mm -hmm. effect, but it's there. <clears throat> All right, so after the emergence of the First Amendment, things are fairly stable for a long time. 1859 arrives and think of 1859 this is a, a year in which two drastic publications come one is john stuart mills on liberty but much more importantly in my view is charles darwin mm -hmm. and his book revolution right same year both of them and charles darwin needed huge amount of protection uh, from the religious bigots. These two documents put together become so monumentally big in their societies, right? And what is the effect of them? They completely destroy the church's order. Completely yeah. destroy it. This is where separation of church and state, etc. Everything is emerging now. Right? So it's a complete subversion of a superstructure that existed for centuries prior. And that is the power of words. And there is nothing more I can say in terms of the necessity of free speech, in terms of its importance in a society, than the fact that I have just traced for you the fact that it, words were needed to, to declare it a natural right. And then once it was declared as a natural right, words were used and required to eventually break every superstructure which was oppressive. And the transference of morality from those who gave it upon to you to those to within society to within your larger groups. Now you may do poorly with it, but that liberty came to you only because of words. And that's the inherent necessity of free speech. <clears throat> so no democratic development without free speech. All right, so this was 1859. Now, in India, parallelly, it was quite interesting that in the UK, for example, I told you about seditious libel was a part and parcel, and the law of sedition was part and parcel of an inherent limitation to free speech. But that was done away with in 1837. Okay. Parallelly, in 1870, India is getting its first penal code. James Stephens is giving you first penal code along with Macaulay. As he's introducing it, sedition is introduced into the law in India. Mm -hmm. And this is after 1857. And 1857 for us is a remarkably important date. Because 1857 is the date on which we are no longer beholden to the East India Company. We become an actual colony of the Queen. The British. Right? So now we're the colony of the Queen. That means the law that will be applied will come from England. And it will obviously serve the masters that make the law. And so in 1870, the law of sedition is introduced. And first up when, in 1870, when the law of sedition is introduced, it actually has the most liberal possible meaning and interpretation that you would find in our law as it stands today which is that mere disaffection or criticism or so on and so forth of the government of the day will not matter. It has to have an act of intended violence behind it for it to constitute sedition. Right? This was a liberal right given. But what happens? It's a colonial government at the end of the day. In 1897-98, Bal Gangadhar Tilak has a sedition trial. And suddenly they're like, yeah, yeah, yeah this, this shit won't fly anymore. <laughs> and now we, now we need a much more narrower interpretation of sedition. Tighten the screws. Tighten the screws. And they did tighten the screws. They did tighten the screws. And they tightened it to mean, now you can't be critical of the government of the day. Right? And I, and yeah. I raise this because when you're seeing the same processes play out in your society today, it's one thing to say, oh, what the courts are doing, or oh, what, what a lawyer is doing, what a court's doing. What are you doing? You as a society accept this. You're willing to take it on board. You're willing to say, because certain incidents and events have occurred in our history, we abrogate this right to the state. Well, but then Indians are not known for brilliant things. No, no, it's not, it's not a brilliant thing. It's not, see, you've got to understand, I don't blame anybody 
at the end of the day, what are we looking at, Kushal? This is why I, I, I've taken so long to explain the basis of where the right came from. Because what, you know, you have one set of countries where the right evolves as an inherency of the human condition. And in another, it is a conferred right. In fact, there is no right. Freedom of speech is what? It's nothing other than the state choosing not to prosecute you. Because that's the kind of power the colonial state took unto itself. So I completely agree with this observation. In the case of the West, it was an understanding that was a cultural outcome. And in the case of India, this is something that was handed over to us by the colonial master. There's an excellent book by uh, Justice, by, by Justice Dhananjay Dhanan Chandrachud's son, Abhinav Chandrachud. He's a very good thinker on these things. It's called uh, Nation of Rhetoric, right? Uh, my view is that he doesn't flesh out the argument quite as well as he should. And in fact, the argument doesn't fully work, but it largely works. It just hasn't been fleshed out methodologically as well as it could have been, because I don't think he's done the rigor on the sheer amount of case law that was necessary to make such an argument. But his central theme is this, that... Our free speech rights today are no different from our free speech rights in the colonial era. Variations that occur, heightened variations of free speech occur because of the possibility that tech has created, not because your laws have improved. Hmm. Right? Anyway, that's we'll, we'll come to all of that. Uh, jump now to around the World War One period. Right? And this is I'm going to introduce a couple of very basic concepts. So, in, in my view, the philosophical underpinnings of free speech, a part of that I've already covered. Where did they originate from? Natural rights. Why are they important? Because a self-sustaining dem democratic governance system cannot exist without free speech. You cannot alter existing superstructures without free speech. If you cannot alter existing superstructures without free speech, you cannot strengthen democracy. Even though you may have conferred democracy as a system upon yourselves, same thing will happen as you progress where when the women's suffragette movement starts, they start demanding rights. But without free speech, those rights could not have been conferred. Slavery could not have been ended without free speech. Nothing could have happened without free speech. Right? So your democracy to grow, this is what it means. Now, the problem that happens is when you come to the 21st century, people think democracy is now in a nice state of static perfection. It's not. Right? So when I when I show those examples of the 19th century and the 20th century, there was a lot of lot more room for a democracy to grow. Mm -hmm. right? But when we look back with the benefit of hindsight, we think these were obvious steps. They weren't. To those people, they were creative, novel, new steps. They were only possible because of these conjunctive elements within the free, free speech, right? Which is uh, uh, which is conscience, uh, discussion, advocacy, and incitement. With absent any of these, those changes could not have occurred. And they were drastic changes for that time period. Right? So anyway, now we come to World War One, And around World War One, India is now, we're going to take two parallels. We're going to take the United States and we're going to take India. Right? And we're going to see how these rights develop. India is obviously in colonial throes at this moment in time. Mahatma Gandhi is about to return. Uh... The Brits now know that they need to get tighter and tighter upon us, and that, and they are. So these sedition rights, etc., are moving forward. Around this time, around the end of World War One, the Rangira Rasool incident happens. Right, where a pamphlet was written in severe, harsh criticism of Islam. In response to a pamphlet written, which was called Sita Kirasoi. That's right. And eventually what happens is that the person, I forget his name, I'm sorry, I'm forgetting the name of uh, Lala something, I'm forgetting his name. He was killed. And the killer the was... The publisher raised. was killed. The publisher was killed. Publisher. And, the, and the killers were hailed as martyrs by the Muslim community. Hmm. Right? So this is all, and that leads to the passage of 295A and 153A, as we see them today. Right? But at the same time, in the United States, they've now entered World War I, and they've introduced a law that requires compulsory conscription. They call it the draft law. 
and there are a bunch of these guys one guy called shenk who is challenge who's circulating pamphlets challenging this law right when we talk about challenging laws we only think of them in terms of go file a writ petition in a court but that's not the only way protest is the greatest threat right so he's protesting everywhere saying these there can be no you cannot compel my body to be used in a particular way this is not a war i believe in i'm a conscientious objector something that ali did in uh, subsequent war vietnam Korean war vietnam war right so shank is circulating these pamphlets and he gets arrested under various legislation state legislation essentially saying this causes a disaffection against the state and will affect the security of the state right despite the fact that Oliver Wendell Holmes one of the great american judges is on the bench the prosecution is upheld the, these are those uh, famous three judgments right yeah. fire yeah. in the movie theater or whatever yeah and by the way that the person who was murdered was mahashay rampal rajpal before i come to shank this is something i i wanted to cover uh, this is a small note i had made when the american law was developing right one of the things that they were really enamored by and this is really the nature of power was the english system of legislative privilege and what legislative privilege permitted was that within the confines of your law making body whatever it may be congress senate parliament whichever name you may call it by your right to speak was absolute and it was subject only to the rules of that parliament for the conduct of its proceedings and not to the laws that generally apply in society right the americans were very affected by this this is a fantastic system because if you don't have that kind of liberty within your law making bodies you actually can't have laws developing you can't have a vibrant discussion you can't have a strong debate right but while the legislative privilege helped to comprehend the importance of free speech even among the citizenry outside of legislator to ensure self government right so having seen what this meant they understood this is what free speech does this is how important it is it can alter how you think and how laws are passed but they did understand that outside of legislature it can have much more pernicious effects than it does inside legislature so two different things one is to understand the vitality of free speech because of the legislative privilege but the other is to understand you also need some restrictions outside that don't exist within the legislature right so hence libel hence slander hence sedition hence uh, uh public order so on and so forth right and they accept the blackstonian composition of the law which is a difference between prior restraint and post facto punishment prior restraint should never happen while there is no protection from the latter which is from post facto punishment full acceptance of the theory that the amendment operates only to bar most prior restraints of expression but subsequent punishment of all but a narrow range of expressions in political discourse and indeed in all fields of expression dates from a quite recent period law develops into what we call the first amendment only in the 60s shank's case he is actually prosecuted and the court say yeah yeah he is validly prosecuted and this goes on through the 20s and we come then to the 60s and in the 60s a series of judges the so 60s again an incredible time in the united states right so the 60s is the era of an explosion in terms of rights but also the era of jfk the era of martin luther king of malcolm x of jimmy hoffa assassinations happening at a political assassinations happening at a rate at which which actually only happen when ideas are being moved at this velocity as they were in the us at that point in time 
And that's what free speech also does. So much of what the nation is today was developed in that time period, right? And the courts kept pace. The courts kept pace. And Brandenburg versus Ohio, incredible judgment. Skokie versus Illinois, another incredible judgment. In Skokie versus Illinois, a, a bunch of uh, neo-Nazis were given the right to carry out a peaceful march through a Jewish Holocaust survival colony. Yeah. ACLU fought that case. That's right. That's right. Why? Because this does not meet the the, st the standard of incitement. Again, I'm going to go back to that conscience, discussion, advocacy, and incitement. Only the last incitement is actionable. And even for it to be inact for it to be actionable, it requires certain conditions. Not all incitement is action. Because all ideation, this is what they say, all ideation is in a sense incitement. If I share an idea, I am inciting you. I don't know what actions you will take from there, but I am inciting you. Maybe your mm -hmm. interpretation is a, is a healthy, positive interpretation and you adapt it differently in your life. Or maybe mm -hmm. you, look at, you look at it and see, this needs violence in society first. So incitement then became really the central theme of how to view free speech. Clear and present danger was the test that Oliver Wendell Holmes established in Schenck versus the United States. And what is clear and present danger? If you use words that create a clear and present danger in terms of violence, then you can be prosecuted. And Schenck was believed to have had the foresight to know this would be clear and present danger, which is what he's creating. Now, I, I, I'm going to state the second principle and then I'm going to show the distinction between the two. Okay, Clear and present danger as a doctrine holds this way for about 30, 40 years in the United States. But in the 60s, it's done away with. Right? And now I'm going to, if you'll allow me, I'm going to read Brandenburg versus Ohio in extenso. Large sure. part, so it's important. All right? Now, so essentially, what is, the facts of this case are important. Brandenburg was a Ku Klux Klan member in Ohio. Uh, he had made a phone call to a local radio station and invited them to a Ku Klux Klan uh, meeting. And that radio station owner, the radio station journalist, along with a cameraman, went to this Ku Klux Klan meeting and filmed it. Right? And the film didn't turn out to be very clean or clear, but there was enough there to show huge amounts of derogatory language being used qua African-Americans, qua Jews, qua various other communities. And the general theme, a theme that not too dissimilar to the one that white militias use today, that if you're going to sit back and watch the, the destruction of the white man, then we're going to ma march upon you and march upon this country. Right? <clears throat> the prosecution's case rested on the films and on testimony identifying the appellant as the person who communicated with the reporter and who spoke at the rally. The state also introduced into evidence several articles appearing in the film, including a pistol, a rifle, a shotgun, ammunition, a Bible, and a red hood worn by the speaker in the films. Right? So they're showing not only do you have the words of anger and incitement, but you clearly have the tools for violence in your possession as well. Hmm. And this is why this, this, par this paragraph is important. And they, they conducted this organizers meeting and said, we are marching on Congress July the 4th, 400,000 strong. And we are dividing into two groups, one group on to march on St. Augustine, Florida, the other group to march into Mississippi. Right. So again, now incitement moves towards actually mobilizing people. I'm just putting various small elements in as we go along. I'm going to come back now for a moment again to those natural rights. One of the natural rights that Locke had secured was, that, was the right to revolt. You have the right as a citizenry to revolt against a government of tyranny. Mm -hmm. Right? And just see 
that this particular concept having been inherent to the development of the Anglosphere, how that tends to affect the judgment, right? So now I'm going to read one, one bit for you. The mere abstract teaching of the moral propriety or even moral necessity for a resort to force and violence. I'm going to repeat that. The mere abstract teaching of the moral propriety or even moral necessity for a resort to force and violence. That is, you are saying force and violence in certain circumstances are imperative. They are necessary. They are, in fact, morally correct. Right? is not the same as preparing a group for violent action and stealing it to such action. Because of their historical roots, they are willing to accept the language of violence is an inherent right. Hmm. Right? Now, the act that he was charged under was the o Ohio Criminal Syndicalism Act. The act punishes persons who advocate or teach the duty, necessity, or propriety of violence, exactly contrary to what I just read earlier. Right? That's what the act said. It criminalizes the advocacy or the teaching of the duty, the necessity, or propriety of violence as a means of accomplishing industrial or political reform, or those who publish or circulate or display any book or paper containing such advocacy, or who justify the commission of violent acts with intent to exemplify, spread, or advocate the propriety of the doctrines of criminal syndicalism, or who voluntarily assemble with a group formed to teach or advocate the doctrines of criminal syndicalism. What are we talking about here, Kusha? This, if you if you gave this, if you gave this statute to an Indian legislator today, they'd say it's a perfectly reasonable statute. If you if you gave it to any Indian today, they are. I looked at it and I thought it was a perfectly reasonable statue on the face of it. Right? What is it saying? That if you are advocating violence, justifying it, meeting it in groups to talk about it, then you are committing a criminal act. Justice Black phenomenal judgment destroys this destroys all of it first thing it destroys is clear and present danger clear and present danger you have to be careful about one thing clear and present danger doesn't say that you can see the violence about to occur or that the person is actually definitely promoting the violence it just means that you should be able to anticipate that violence right and you remember that famous uh, example that you spoke of which is a famous example of shouting fire in a in a crowded theater that leads to death. Yeah. That was used as an example by Oliver Wendell Holmes of clear and present danger. Mm -hmm. Right? Black says, no, that does not constitute clear and present danger. That, in fact, constitutes incitement because the, the words and the act are so closely linked to each other. The act being the immediate stampede that is caused. Mm. So it was a misinterpretation to call this clear and present danger. And he basically says, I doubt if clear and present danger test is congenial to the First Amendment in time of a declared war. I am certain it is not reconciliable with the First Amendment in days of peace. So clear and present danger is gone. And he discusses various tests that come and go. And then he says, when one reads opinions closely and sees when and how the clear and present danger test has been applied, great misgivings are aroused. First, the threats were often loud, but always puny and made serious only by judges. So wedded to the status quo, a critical analysis made them nervous. Think about all the comedians that have been arrested in India at some point in time. Comedians ka hara, har koi arrest jo hota hai. Wait, so, but but look at what he says, and this is why I think this is one of the finest passages I've ever read. I'm going to repeat this again. When one reads the opinions closely and sees when and how the clear and present danger test has been applied, great misgivings are aroused. First, the threats were often loud, but always puny. You have to have that sense of scale about what threat you're looking at. And made serious only by judges. It's a self-critical statement that in your when you start analyzing that item of speech, 
suddenly you are like whoa why 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 are you like this you shouldn't be thinking like this only by judges so wedded to the status quo that critical analysis made them nervous second the test was so twisted and perverted in dennis to make a trial of those teachers of marxism an all out political trial which was first and which was part of parcel of the cold war that has eroded the strength of parts of the first amendment dennis was another case where marxists were put on trial and were found guilty for merely preaching marxism right and he said this is wrong it, it, it doesn't exist and here's the next great sentence from his action is often a method of expression and within the protection of the first amendment suppose one tears up his own copy of the constitution in eloquent protest to a decision of the court may he be indicted answer is no right the example usually given by those who would punish speech is the case of one who falsely shouts fire in a crowded theater this is how a classic case where speech is brigaded with action that's what i was telling you earlier apart from rare instances of that kind of speech i think immune from prosecution <clears throat> i think speech is immune from prosecution certainly there is no constitutional line between advocacy of abstract ideas as in yates and advocacy of political action the quality of advocacy turns on the depth of the conviction the government has no power to invade that sanctuary of belief and conscience right <clears throat> i can imagine indians listening to this right now and just cringing hi hi ye to bahut zyada ho gaya <laughs> yeah statutes affecting the right of assembly like those touching on the freedom of speech must observe the established distinction between advocacy and incitement to imminent lawless action and what is imminent lawless action imminent lawless action is sorry one second Huh. so i'm going to read what is imminent lawless action we have fashioned mm-hmm. the principle that the constitutional guarantees of free speech and free press do not permit us permit a state to forbid or prescribe advocacy or the use of force or of law or of law violation except where such advocacy is directed to inciting or producing imminent lawless action and second test is likely to incite or produce such action in fact that action should occur तो बेसिकली मतलब शर्जील इमाम को जेल नहीं होती थी अमेरिका में परफेक्ट यू हिट द नेल ऑन द हेड बिकॉज़ आई एम गोइंग टू गो टू दैट चार्ज फ्रेमिंग ऑर्डर ओके बट ऑल्सो व्हेन यू लुक एट दैट चार्ज फ्रेमिंग ऑर्डर आई हैव टू गिव इट टू द मैजिस्ट्रेट 92 पेज पेज लॉन्ग ऑर्डर ही इज रियली डन अ जॉब एंड दैट 92 पेजेस ही इज डिस्कस्ड ऑल द लॉ ही इज गिवन अ फुल हियरिंग अ ट्रेमेंडस चार्ज शीट आल्सो I think the High Court will have a great time trying to analyze this order. This could go either way. It's one of those things, right? So now examine whatever happens around here. But these are these are the principles that arose. Now I come back again to this very important point because I think this is the point of distinction between us and them. These judges were comfortable with calls to violence. because of the way their society is developed and i don't think it is necessarily wrong for us to say that our judges not being comfortable with these calls of violence is necessarily bad it may not be because of the state of law and order and the overall state, state of law and order how it all came to you so i've covered a little bit of america right now i wanted to like first principles basics clear and present danger means a judge is sitting there and anticipating oh but this could have been dangerous right rejected in america replaced with imminent lawless action and likelihood of act of violence in india we have a judgment in 2015 which is the great shreya singhal judgment which is a judgment by which 66a of the it act was struck down and it is lauded as a great progressive freedom of speech judgment and what does it establish as the standard of free speech clear and imminent danger hmm clear and present danger so a a a concept rejected 100 years ago in many other countries 
right? But are we really to be blamed in that sense? Because we've had a lot of political development. So now come to the crux, which is come back to India, right? So like I said, sedition is gone in the UK in 1837, introduced in India in 1870 with our new, improved, lovely, shiny new IPC. And initially, it's a narrow right, a very narrow right. But over time, when Bal Gangadhar Tilak's case comes along, they're like, buddy, we can't go this narrow anymore. Ye to thoda uh, jada ho you ho have to expand the scope of this section and say that even if you're generally affecting disaffection, right? So that becomes your legacy. It's the awful thing about legal systems at times. Right? Good or bad, that's locked into posterity. That becomes your first principles. Mm. Right? It could have so easily been that we ourselves accepted that violent change is a necessary imperative and element of our society. Had, for example, we not been progressing politically through a peaceful means of obtaining independence. Had we done it violently, we might as well have said, Yes, those same rules that a government, a tyrannical government against that, you have a right to revolt. And the advocacy of violence, unless it is imminent and likely to cause immediately, should be protected. We may well have gone down that path. Right? So this is our history. Be that as it may. Things happen as they happen. We now have a constitution in place. Right? And now I'm going to help you contrast the Thomas Jefferson moment to the Jawaharlal Nehru moment. Hey, 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 hey. Right? Remember I told you Thomas Jefferson followed his worst instincts and tried to restrict speech as much as he could, get people nailed for sedition. And in that sedition clause also added a clause that said, the Sedition Act also added a clause that said, you can't even criticize the President of the Congress. Congress being their House of Parliament, not a political party, right? What happens with us when we first formulate Article 19.1a, which is the freedom of speech and expression, we don't say more than that. We don't say the press. We don't categorize beyond that. We give a very broad right of freedom of speech and expression in consonance with modern constitution drafting at that time. Ireland was similar. Other constitutions were similar. Modern constitutions were drafted in this language. We then introduced 19.2. 19.2 existed in the constitution in 1950. Remember this. People tend to make this mistake. It existed in 1950, but it had very narrow grounds. Okay. And the grounds that it had, and the thing that bothered the most, right? True to the kind of political instincts that we find even in our politicians even today, Panditji wanted to restrict the ability of his critics and his opponents to speak. It's very interesting. He, he, he used to hate those criticisms by the Marxists then. No, 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 no. He, he, so both Crossroads is Marxist, organizer is RSS. Yes. This is in 1950. Is like left wing, right wing. <laughs> yeah, as long as it's not Pandit wing. So what he does is he passes or, or the states pass and states are basically Congress at that time, right? So to accept the reality of the truth. Then. The states pass various public order, public order and public safety maintenance legislation. Right. And remember the Supreme Court at that time used to sit in the parliament building and there were actually five judges. Five brilliant judges. What judgments they've written at that time. Incredible. One of the best things that I ever did as a young lawyer, and I and I I suggest this to everybody, through law school and through my graduate from my early years in the profession, first first year, in fact, there's not a judgment from 50 to about 65, 68 that I didn't read. They're very short, often they're very short, they're very well reasoned. These Volumes are also very thin. You can go through them very easily. But you have to have, like, when I say very easily, you have to have a work ethic to you. Right? Because you have other work to do in any event. And nothing sorts out your first principles on any subject matter of law like the judges of that time. Lecture Bazi started in the 70s. 
the great Krishna Iyer regarded as one of the greatest deacons of justice in this country. I mean, I can't read the man. मतलब जो ग्रंथ लिखने की हैबिट थी वो बाद में आई. ग्रंथ लिखना but ग्रंथ के साथ फटे बाजी इम अनमेजरेबल फटे बाजी राइट सोशलिज्म के नाम पर कुछ भी लिख दो कुछ भी लिख दो यू नो दैट वर्चुअल सिग्नलिंग केम इनटू आवर जजमेंट्स एनीवे बी दैट एज इट मे अस इट्स अ साइड पीस ऑफ एडवाइस बट देयर वर टू जजमेंट्स दैट आई वांट टू फोकस ऑन ब्रिज भूषण वाज अ स्टेट ऑफ दिल्ली एंड रवेश ठाकुर वाज अ स्टेट ऑफ मद्रास इन मद्रास ही वाज ट्राइंग टू ही वाज ट्राइंग टू शट डाउन ए कम्युनिस्ट पब्लिकेशन कॉल्ड क्रॉस रोड्स इन दिल्ली ही वाज ट्राइंग टू शट डाउन ऑर्गेनाइज right and these guys are generally picked up they were they were banned like these all these publications were banned under the public order act saying this will cause uh, a lack of public safety public order i remember i told you 192 used to be narrower and 192 other than sedition your basic grounds of liberal sedition etc exactly the grounds that we've been discussing have been the traditionalist grounds mm. right what it didn't have is sedition as a word what it had was you can pass a reasonable a, a reasonable restriction as a matter of law on a matter which undermines the security of or tends to overthrow the state this was the clause hmm. and this clause was interpreted by supreme court both these judgments to say this has to be such a high level that it has to be extreme violence against the state capable of overthrowing the government you cannot say two publications are doing that. आजकल तो लोग बोलते हैं ट्वीट कर देता है वो सो सो दीस टू एक्ट स्ट्राइक डाउन दिस लॉ एंड तारा सिंह गोपीचंद वर्सेस द स्टेट ऑफ पंजाब अ पंजाब हाई कोर्ट टू जजेस वन ऑफ देम एन इंग्लिश जज दे स्ट्रक डाउन 124 ए 153 ए एंड एंड द लोकल लेजिस्लेशन सेइंग दैट दिस नन ऑफ दिस कैन कंप्लाई नाउ दैट यू हैव फ्रीडम यू यू हैव आर्टिकल 191 ए एंड 192 One twenty-four A sedition was gone. It was off your text. It was gone. By the time the challenge came to the Supreme Court, it was upheld. Why? Because in nineteen fifty-one, the First Amendment came, and the First Amendment changed the language of "in the interests of public order and public safety." The words "in the interests of" are of a much broader import than a matter which undermines the security of or tends to overthrow the state. in the interest of public security and public order suddenly meant that for general public order legislation things could apply you you could pass that too and that is where this sort of oppressive law making started right and nehru went into election in 51 as well remember this so just like jefferson he went into an election but he went with the and, and he must have been a very astute politician because he went with the opposite view of what jefferson went in with he went to the people saying i need to pass these laws to protect you and this comes back again to that original point that i made about having the cultural tools within society yeah absolutely at, at what cultures, stage is a society mentally can be gauged by what a politician is trying to sell to the society thinking that it is going to be a winning strategy exactly right <clears throat> so in 1957 ramji lal modi's case comes which upholds 295a uh and after that there are some wins for free speech it's not as if free speech had no wins uh, at some point we have to do two things we do two or three more podcasts but one we have to do is this first amendment business we have to really look at because you know while this happened to free speech what i've just read out to you overall the court still did reasonably well on free speech what they totally destroyed were right to property private property and the freedom of trade and expression freedom of trade and uh, freedom of trade and profession that we have to do at some point in time because the it's it's heinous what they did to that right and we are suffering to date because of our economic policy yeah terrible right so in in between you have the suckle newspaper case and the suckle newspaper case is an interesting one that uh, by law they try to restrict the number of pages that a newspaper can publish 
There was another case later of Indian Express where they tried to limit, uh, impose an additional duty on newsprint. Right. So first cycle newspaper, and there were two ordinances, two laws. The first was uh, two, two, two orders passed by the central government. One restricted the dissemination of news and views by the newspapers. The latter, so the court holds that because you have restricted the number of pages and you have restricted advertising, you have effectively killed newspapers, which is a great protection. The freedom of a newspaper to publish any number of pages and to circulate to any number of persons is an integral part of the freedom of speech. That's what we'll say. Regulation and of advertising space and forced or re regulation of advertising space forced newspapers either to raise their prices and compromise on circulation or to run at losses, eventually forcing them to close down. This was a direct and not a remote or incidental infringement on the right to freedom of speech and expression. And so it was contended that advertising is a commercial aspect of speech and restrictions in public's interest may be placed on it under 196 is what the what, what the government had said. However, the court held the freedom of speech cannot take, be taken away with the object of restricting business activities. It's, it's actually a very mature judgment. If you look at it, it, it looks at the freedom of the press in a holistic way. The freedom of the press is nothing without the business itself. And so the judgment protects the business itself, right? And then I, I'd mentioned the Shreya single judgment, which does very well in striking down 66A. It, it's actually a really good read because it sets out all the law and it sets a clear and present danger test and says these law, the, the, those rules, because those rules were crazy. They said you can't do annoyance online. You can't do various other things online, right? All of that was gone. So that, that got struck down. What I'm trying to sort of I just at. still sit and wonder how can anyone come up with a law like that? It's unbelievable. <laughs> well, that 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 one is couple simple. Yes. Right. I was thinking we could take a couple of sort of more recent developments and discuss yeah. those. Uh, sure. Namely, our good friends at the Haridwar hate speech convention. That's what yeah, I like first, to call it. First, pe people need to also realize that this is the hate speech ka issue. Hai na. Uh, chal, See, I want you to talk about it, then maybe I'll say something. No, Kushal, I, I, I'm actually going to keep it to a very limited touching in terms of just that Yati Narsing Anand case, the Haridwar case, and Sharjeel Imam based on the order. We should do a podcast on this one day. There is a huge amount of development of law happening on hate speech in the international criminal tribunals, particularly in the context of how to detect and prosecute propaganda in the context of a genocide. So Rwanda, Yugoslavia, etc. In those contexts, there's a lot of law legal development happening. And I don't want to I don't want to crush all of that in today. It'll be a bit too much. Sure. Today was more about theoretical sure. underpinnings and how these laws sort of how, how the right independently developed in two different circumstances. That's really the main takeaway I want to give today. Right? But so, there are certain good judgments. Like I said, 19, the First Amendment may have come, but freedom of speech largely, I mean, it manages to survive, not so much as, not, not, not necessarily thrive, but survive to a large degree because the the, the courts always come back and say that you have to have a clear and present danger as to violence. There has to be some fear of violence, right? Not quite as high as Brandenburg versus Ohio, but still a fear of violence. The first time they did that, clarifying in the context of sedition was in a judgment, work, judgment called Kedarnath Singh versus State of Bihar, <clears throat> where they say clearly that The provisions of the sections read as a whole along with the explanations make it reasonably clear that the sections aim at rendering penal only such activities as would be intended or have a tendency to create disorder or disturbance of public peace by resort to violence. As already pointed out, the explanations appended to the main body of the section make it clear that the criticism of public measures or comment on government action, however strongly worded, 
would be within reasonable limits and would be consistent with the fundamental rights of freedom of speech and expression. Right? So this was suggestion. Similar standard of speech protection has also been applied to UAPA, the famous UAPA, that even where you are in you are enforcing UAPA, unless there is action and deed, that's a different kind of case because then you can be can be a terrorist by action and deed. But if it is only a question of words, then those words must have some degree of incitement to violence and apprehend that violence would occur. Right? Do you want to do a brief set of questions in between first or because I'm sure they're piling up? Actually, it's better. I'll ask you a few questions. So, uh, because I think they are... Uh... But after that, I'll come back to... Uh, yeah, a couple of topics that I want to cover. So, you know, because I'll tell you why. Because someone has asked this question out of 124A, 153A, 505A and B, 295A. <laughs> Both funny question. Hai. Which do you think are misused the most? And considering India's law and order practically and politically, how should we go about repealing this over the next 10 years? I know what you, you feel originally because we have spoken about this. So repealing to about Durki Vata, which is the most dangerous? I would say everything is dangerous, buddy. It depends on the context. I mean, if you look at the existing judgments on the on the issue, sedition should not be dangerous, but sedition is proving to be very dangerous because they apply it everywhere. Yeah. You know, yeah. it's a topic I've covered for late I've left for later, not a topic, but certain observations that I've left for later, which is essentially that when it comes to uh our freedom of speech, right? We are somewhat beholden to the fact that the judges themselves can't trust policing enough. So they take whatever the police gives you on, on face value and are arresting people, allowing arrests to happen. You may get bail later, but the damage is kind of done, you know. Yeah. So I, two other I, questions I were pretty much I can't I can't pick one out of those. I I let me, let, let, let me rephrase that answer a little bit. I'll put it this way to you. I think when it comes to the integrity of the nation, we are in a stronger position than we've ever been. Okay? So I really hate the use of sedition. But I think when it comes to the law of sedition, uh, the courts will come down easily and, and deal with it. It's religion as a superstructure that we can't seem to get past. And we need to get past Yeah, just religion. like America is obsessed with race, we are obsessed with religion. It's just both the countries. We need to get past obsession. religion as a superstructure. And that can't happen as long as 295A and 153A are in place. Yeah, so me, I, I would have uh, given the same answer. I think the biggest impediment to India as of now is overburdening, uh, uh, you know, religiosity and where religion seems to be you know, the be all and end all of everything. Uh, I mean, you can be religious, but at the end of the day, if you're going to create a structure where religion ke upar kuch nahi hai, and you can't even ensure anything. So I think 295A and 153A are the biggest threats to India, if you ask me. And, and, and uh, just, just to add to that, also selectively apply it uh, depends on where you are. I don't think in the history of reading about this stuff, I've ever met anybody who destroyed religion quite like Periyar in Tamil Nadu. The way he has spoken mm. of Hindu religion but, and termed it Brahmanism, he, I mean, he's absolutely destroyed it. He wasn't prosecuted. And Tamils have a lot of complaint yeah. about this, that he wasn't ever prosecuted. But be that as it may, that is how progress and change happens. What was the effect of him not being prosecuted? An entire uh, movement was created, Dravidianism. An entire movement, an entire political structure, an entire a state that operates politically different from other states. What's so wrong with that? Yeah, I personally don't think. Uh, I may not agree with that ideology, but I think they have a right to be the way they are. Yeah, but they could only generate that kind of ideology because there was no unnecessary prosecution under 295A and 153A. I agree. Right? And, and I, I but, believe those laws no, no, should but, go. But there is a problem here. There is a problem here. You could argue, I could argue the playing field would be level if the persons who wish to oppose Dravidianism in Tamil Nadu could speak equally freely. Are, but they're not allowed, no. They they're can't. not allowed. They can't. they can't because inherently caste issues come up. 
So all these laws, the SCST Prohibition Act, etc., which has even been broadened by the Modi government even further, that puts limits on free speech where you can't actually attack the ideology anymore. Which is why I say, if I am all for peria rights and their right to spew as much hate as they want to, but at the same time, if you want to give some, you got to take some, which is my way of living a society. But I know people will not agree to it because, you know, India is an authoritarian minded society. Indians on average, you know, what, which is what I did with my speech, right? I am a liberal. I believe in free speech as long as you say what I want to hear. In India, it is not freedom loving people. India has mini Mao's everywhere, Saste Stalin's everywhere, where the whole idea is that bring me to power, I will decide what is to be spoken, what is to be allowed, and I will control your life. The problem in India has so many mini Mao's now, to submit tussle chalti rehti aur thoda bhot allow ho raha Because we are having multiple Maoists and multiple authoritarians. It is no one authoritarian in India because our authoritarianism may be diversity, hai na? Usme bhi, pluralistic diversity. Hai usme Ki har kisam ke uljulul kisam ke authoritarians hai. But the other two questions were very you know, repetitive in that sense, where they said, okay, we can't have American style free speech cut, but can we have something closer to it? Currently in India, free speech leans, my speech must be free. Or somebody said, would it ever be possible for a society to have absolute free speech? Could we? achieve it in the future if everyone became no, an oral it's, objective I, as well, it's not going to happen. You know, I listened to these questions and I wonder whether people have understood what I was saying. Look, there was a cultural background to why it developed one way in one country and that was my whole point, right? And why it developed differently for us here. So unless mm. you can accept that cultural variance first, like stand up for your uh, Munawar Faruqi, stand up for your other comedians, stand up for your at the same time, stand up for Yati Narsing Anand when he's not talking about genocide. When he's talking about, when, when he's limiting himself to advocacy, when he's when he's abusing, when he's when he's highly abusive, highly offensive. Stand up similarly for uh, Ovesi. Stand up for all these guys. If you can culturally start doing this, you can have very, much, uh, very quickly you can alter the notions of free speech. Yeah. And secondly, just to add one point over here is, I I think this is a perfect time to read Mill's Trident, where, you know, why do we need free speech? So I'm going to read it where, and this is from, uh, you know, uh, an article in Aereo, and they push, put the three points there beautifully. They said, one, you are wrong, in which case freedom of speech is essential to allow people to correct you, right? That is point number one. Two, you're partially correct. In which case you need free speech and contrary viewpoints to help you get a more precise understanding of what the truth really is. Three, you are 100% correct. It is in this unlikely event, you still need people to argue with you, to try to contradict you and to try to prove wrong, prove you wrong. Why? Because you never have, never have to defend your points of view. There is a very good chance that you don't really understand them and that you hold them the same way you would hold a prejudice or superstition. It's only through arguing with contrary viewpoints that you could come to understand why what you believe is true. So in a sense, you know, free speech is not necessarily for things that you like to hear. It is all about things that you don't like to hear. It is always about that because we could be wrong. No, no, but, but this is at the individual level, right? Now, let's understand something. Free speech as a concept and as a right only arises when the state cracks down on the person who's speaking. It doesn't, it's not so much, it's not about interpersonal aspects. So I, I want to come back to what I'd said earlier. The greatest justification for it that was discovered as it was developing was the greatest goal of democracy is self-government, Right? This is why you get rid of kings. This is why you get rid of top-down governance system. It's self-government. Citizens should have a greater say and a greater right. This is why, for example, we are stressing more for local government. Why we want more devolution of powers from centers to local areas. Because you want more of an effect, more of a say in the average citizen. right? And for that, free speech is an absolute imperative. You cannot break down structures without free speech. You cannot alter laws without free speech. So... Democ when, when, I want people to be able to walk away from this podcast clearly able to enunciate that without free speech, that famous statement, 
democracy can't exist without free speech. This is why it can't. Because democracy and every society has its own structures. Those structures need to be broken down. The most peaceful way to break them down is with words. Harsh words at times. Yes. To alter bad laws, you need words. To establish better systems, you need words. To alter social structures, you need words. In the context of democracy, this is the most important thing. And of course, for your self-enlightenment and self-growth, I think the, the principles that you pointed to are more about an individual's own growth. Those are quintessential. Yes. And I don't know how to put it, but a society which has a much higher moral uh, standing is only going to lead to all kinds of prosperity. If you do not imagine if, you know, a company becomes so powerful that it can influence the state in shutting down all kinds of criticism that it doesn't like. And it leads to an absolute disaster. By the way, it has already started to happen with big tech. I, 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 I already see the signs of it where, oh, you, you can't question the vaccine. Uh, you can't question this. You can't challenge this. Uh, you can't challenge the lab leak theory. You can't challenge this. It is already happening. This is it happening is in front of our eyes. And people are so moronic because they do not... There is no bigger value in my eyes than free speech. That is the biggest value structure. Why? Because you cannot exercise any right without it. There is no right you can exercise without it. Not a single one. Yeah. No, but, why, but I want to go back. This is to why, this this why question, I, I'll come back again to it. This is why right at the beginning, I, I, I started with biology. What makes human beings different? Evolutionary biology. What makes us different? It's this ability of speech. It's the ability to put complex words together, create complex languages. So the use of those languages is the most inherent and natural aspect of human existence. That is why it is imperative. It's the most basic thing. Hmm. But but let's let's keep the last bit talking about Jati Narsanganand and that Hardwar conference and Sharjil Imam. Now, what exactly is happening in those two cases? <laughs> Well, in Yati Nursing Anand's case, there's an arrest. Uh, as with the man, for, the, the artist formerly known as Vaseem Rizvi, who is now, I, I forget his name. I, I, he's taken a Hindu name. I forget what it is. He's also been arrested. Uh, each of them will have different mm -hmm. words attributed to them. I believe, and I have not looked it very sharply, so forgive me if I'm in error, but I believe Yati Narsing Anand's case is where he has actually called for genocide against Muslims. Right? Now, mm -hmm. let's assume he has and come back and analyze with me the clear and present danger test versus imminent violence. Yeah, so he Random won't go to jail violence. in America. In America, he won't. Exactly right. Yeah, exactly he won't right. go to jail. He won't go to jail. He can't. But then so, so will Sharjil Imam not go to jail in America. Well, with Sharjil Imam, I actually pulled out the order. I have quite extensively published it. See, the difference is this, and this, that's why it's not fair, actually, because with Sharjil Imam, you have a charge sheet. You have an extensive amount of uh, documentation. Uh, so this is one of the paragraphs. I'll just read it out. You know, the problem is he sounds more damned because there is an entire investigation against him. I'm sure once an entire investigation is conducted against Narsingh Anand and the others, it may, it may seem what, may seem bad in, in their context as well. But this is what the court judge says. On a reading and rereading of entire speech, so there are three speeches, firstly. It's not one speech, which are Nima. People keep talking about that chicken neck speech. It's not the only speech. There are three speeches, three different venues. Mm -hmm. Right? He wasn't. Yes. Anybody who's trying to tell you that a Muslim man spoke up and he was immediately arrested. No, he spoke up in three different places in the context of violent protests of CAA and RC. Mm. Right? On a reading and rereading of entire speeches of accused Shajil Imam, at least on a prima facie level, it brings to the core the fundamental thinking, ideas, and intent of the accused. Speeches are delivered and aimed at Muslim audience present there and to whom it will dis disseminate to. It will also be read and heard by people of other communities. The speeches may see, seems to be indicative of showing the worthlessness of the community and existential crises. 
the issue of demographic profile in certain cities is misleading and needs to be explained at trial. Again, the issue of ridiculing cow protection and in the context of secularism requires explanation at trial. It is indeed correct at one level to say the accused has lambasted, all, lambasted almost every institution, constitution and ideas of democracy and secularism as practiced in the entire polity. The accused in his speeches has made vituperative utterances even against the father of the nation. He seems to be skeptical of the idea of secularism and democracy. Right? None of this should qualify as grounds for prosecution, what I've read so far. Imagine everybody who's going to be listening to this and who's a BJP supporter getting triggered right now. Ah, but, 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 but there is one key paragraph because I was saying there has to be a, an accord between words and actions, right? As per the charge sheet, the plan of action he tells and wants the readers and listeners to believe results, results, very important word, Kushal, into various incidents of riots on December 2019 in Delhi as stated in Paradigm above, which he makes reference to in his speeches as well. As per the char charge sheet, there were incidents of riots at Jamia, New Friends Colony, Sirampur, Daryaganj, Northeast Delhi in December 2019, post his speeches and dissemination of material by pamphlets by adoption of strategy propagated by the accused. So but then there's a connection. He spoke and there was immediate violence. Well, this is not enough of a connection in my book. This is not immediate. Okay, then I have to push back here. Then what? There has to be a time frame like immediately? No, no, no. The nature of the material, the level of incitement, people you've arrested, they have to come out, who actually did the violence, they have to come out and say, Shadjil Imam ne kaha tha. something has to be there. This is why you value free speech. He has every right to turn around and say, CAA plus NRC is disenfranchising us. I don't think that's, a, we've been through this podcast, Kuchal. My position is it was disenfranchising people, right? I mean, I can't complain about that. So if he has the right to stress that point of view, this one paragraph takes you at least to the correct standard for prosecution for a speech-related offense. Okay, at least it takes you to the correct standard. Whether that evidence will stand up in court, we'll have to see. Uh, that's hmm. the main para I wanted but to But as of now, uh, at the base level, the judges have thought that there is... And with Nassim Anand's case and with Wasim Rizvi's case, there is no actual violence. Yeah, there isn't. So I believe that if, I mean, at least in the American standard, Narsingh Ananto has clearly passed. This is no endorsement of Narsingh Ananto. I find him abhorrent as a human being. But and not in the same applies to Sir now, now, now apply the Indian standard for a moment. And then this is something very important I want to get to. Clear and present danger is kind of the test in India. Right? Now in the context, the, the case that will be built up there, this is why when you see people motivated people on Twitter and on social media, other, other social media platforms, pushing for his arrest, pushing, pushing for his prosecution. They try to play it up saying this is happening in the context of a larger genocide or an attempted genocide. This is what they're trying to get at, right? That you are speaking in a context in which your words can now lead to violence. They don't need to actually lead to violence. That's the difference between a clear and present danger test and a imminent uh, Brandenburg's test of imminent violence uh, and likelihood. Right? So it doesn't actually need to lead to violence, but it needs to be a clear and present danger that violence will in fact occur. But then will a person that connect uh, Islamism to the holy book? Should the holy book be banned? Should the verses be banned? Calcutta petition. All been taken care of already. Original it's the verses same logic. Or, original it's verses can't logic. be banned. Original, original, original books can't be banned. Already done and dusted. Calcutta petition. And I promise you there's not a court in the country who will want to listen to it. In fact, Vaseem Rizvi took this case to the Supreme Court. Where he took various verses and says these verses have to be deleted. Which is quite a silly prayer to ask for. The Supreme Court turned around and very easily said, how can we delete a holy text? So therefore not maintainable and, and put costs upon it. Good. Somebody has asked recent, not just now in the live chat, what about Akbaruddi Novesi? How does his uh, speech also pass now? Because he made a speech, it didn't lead to any violence. So by American standards, even Akbaruddi Novesi is fine. But by Indian standards, he has to go to jail. Oh, I don't know what his speech was. I don't know what he actually said. I don't know what it was. Yeah, remember, his speech was that we have 15 minutes, we will have to go to the house, kind of a thing. Yeah, 
Yeah, well, where is the clear and imminent danger there? That is just a, a veiled threat. It's an empty threat. So my, I'm telling you this. I, I've, I've gone through a lot of these so-called hate speech from Muslim political leaders. Keep the religious leaders out. Religious leaders are very direct. But political leaders. And to me, it just sounds like a rendition of angry young man movies. Man, I mean, I'll do this, I'll do that. But you know, nothing's really happening. My view of violence from that from that side is when it has to happen, you barely need any insight. You know who should be in for that kind of insight? All those Hmm. Malvis or all those people who put out a fatwa or put out money on uh, on uh, Kamlesh Tiwari's head. Because that violence occurred. Mm -hmm. Somebody was incited. Even if it had failed at an attempt, that was enough. Okay, so basically a direct call with a cash reward to murdering someone fails every single test. I think those guys should be put away right away. Like the moment they make that kind of call, under chalo away. They would be put away in America too, na? They would, absolutely. They won't dare say that in America. They only get away with these things in India. Just one, one, one aspect I think we could probably touch upon and then we'll wrap it up. Is this whole hate speech business. No, no, tell me so something. What? Uh, you, you, had, you had in the beginning warned people it'll be a little long. Is this long enough by our standards today? No, no, our standards are okay. We've talked for 2 hours and 15 minutes. Yeah, yeah, we've gone longer. Anyway, ask me, tell me. No, so I want to focus a little bit on hate speech because the most consen- you know, contentious subject in India and let us spend some time on hate speech. Is actually this whole fluffy concept of hate speech. As uh, in, I told you, what is the definition of hate speech legally in India? 153A, 295A, anything that causes offense. That has also been interpreted but that in. That is uh, blasphemy, na? Blasphemy, thorna hate. hate no, 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 no. That, is, that has been interpreted. Then, then there is no standard of hate speech per se. It all fits under the same thing. 153A is hate speech, where you're inciting against two separate communities. 295A is blasphemy. Kalu versus state of Andhra Pradesh. The standard is that you have to be, again, clear and present danger standard. But, okay, what was that judgment in America, in the Supreme Court, which clearly said hate speech is legal? All of them. What I've just pointed out to you, all of them. So, how the hell do we explain this to Indians? (laughs) (laughs) I've been talking, so I, this is why I, again, you know, I, this is why I, I started with that whole sort of cultural element to how the rights evolved. We have to find a way of replacing all that contextualized cultural growth and replacing it with robust notions now while sort of decluttering all our context. That's a very difficult thing if you ask me, Gosho. No, so, okay. So, let me unpack this. So, what you're saying is that every society goes through a historical process. India has gone through process X. America went through process Y. Now, as far as I see, I think both India and America through went to a very violent process. But the response in both the nation's cases, America, the response is, I will defend your right to say what you want to. And I will also give you the right to bear arms because the government could be Kuti Kamini anytime. They went the other way. India was like, then this is a commentary on us as a people. I don't know how, what else am I supposed to say then. Because it's not like America may violence in easy. Unke bhi batheri violence hui hai. It's not like that society did not suffer. I mean, that yeah, society I... stood up for the speech of racists. Do you think India will stand up for the speech of casteists? I don't think so. No, I don't think India will stand up for anybody's speech at any point in time, especially now that the Prime Minister is talking about duties. I, I, they, we're a very emotional people, man. We get very affected by words. Very, very affected by words. 
And this is why you see some of these prosecutions are so ham-handed. Uh, Disha's prosecution, you remember the toolkit? The toolkit for a long time, I was saying, toolkit ke aage aur kuch bhi hona there has to be, needs to be something. The day that bail hearing was being heard, I misread that, that prosecutor into saying that there was much more than the toolkit, that the toolkit was actually executed in some way. There was nothing. There was no evidence. It was just a toolkit. We were so upset with the toolkit. And what did we put? Sedition. What about all this case law? Mm. It's all ham-handed. I'm sorry. Policing is ham-handed. Uh, and our general approach to these things is ham-handed. It's partisan and we don't care beyond that. Systems don't matter. These also, are not wo your words. No, no. These are also, mine. But I just want to... Oh, no, no, one second, Kusha, also, one more other problem with us as people. We are not risk takers on this side of life, you know, on the political speech side of life. We don't take risks. We don't talk too much. We don't say too much. Very few of us take those risks and we don't, we generally don't tend to like those people, you know. And so, oh, yeah, we you get remember the girl who was arrested in OVC's rally for saying Pakistan Zindabad. Yeah. People actually supported arresting her too. I mean, what is this? I, so these are the kind of cases on which I, I, I've always wondered, what am I putting down as the IPC section that has been violated? Now, the only one I can think of is 505, likelihood of causing public disorder or some crap like that. But I, mean, I, I don't understand where all of this comes from. And it's not curable this it, way. Yeah, I mean, I, I, I'm going to be sounding very harsh, but uh, who cares? I'll say it anyway. It comes from a very feudal mind, it comes from a society which is very feudal, it comes from a society that is still not really civilized, it comes from a society that gives too much importance to some golden age and lives in the past and uh, it wants to protect what I don't know um, and it is very anti-progress and if no, progress comes from someone else, they don't want to take it. Societies and democracies are allowed to be that, though. You know, the, the ultimate goal yeah, of Yeah, they're allowed to be self. that. That's why we are a hellhole. Yeah, I'm, I'm not saying you're not allowed to be that, but yeah, that's, that's why we are a hellhole. So maybe that might be the answer to say self-government is the role of democracy and free speech helps to reach self-government. But this is the self-government standard that we have reached. Are we happy with this? Are we satisfied with this? I'm certainly not. I think Quite it's clearly. Just, you know, we are not, but look at the polls in India. People are so happy. We are the happiest of them. <laughs> Indians are always happy. Polls are that's there. I'm not even making this up. That's not a bad thing. That's not a bad thing by itself. People should be happy. Yeah. So, I mean, it's clearly that, you know, there are, we are the odd people out in this society. I don't even have any problem admitting it in my own show. <laughs> <laughs> that maybe, you know, folks like you and I are not the norm. We have this highfalutin concept where we want to take the society. And no, no, the we're society definitely not the norm. Sanu we're definitely not the norm. We're definitely not the norm. We're to accept that. Free speech is... You know, I, I when I whenever you talk free speech and you have a largely Indian audience, you can just see it. It just doesn't sit with them. They don't get it. They don't want to get it. It doesn't work. Free speech to TK, free speech, but usne aise kaise bol diya. <laughs> Kya bole aadmi yaar, uske upar. It's the most yeah. common lament. Free speech to hai, aapki free speech to hai, but usne aise kaise bol diya. Kya bole ga aadmi iske aage? Yeah, I mean, uh, you know the standard questions that are always that uh, you need some restrictions to preserve diversity of India. How? <laughs> Nobody has a good answer of that. But you, you hear stuff like... Uh, Actually, you know, free speech is a Western concept. You're too colonized. No, huh? that's not wrong. That's not wrong. And if people say free speech is not what they want, then so be it. Yeah. Yeah. Then people who want it should get out of India, I guess. <laughs> that, that's the only thing. Uh, uh, one last question to you. Do you think, not from the Indian perspective, India is a very post post uh, but from the American perspective, do you think big tech is a threat to free speech? 
we did this no last time uh, big tech is obviously a threat to free speech but big tech will also be brought to heel big tech is also a facilitator it's a very pull and push kind of situation dude it's a, you can't dispute the fact that they are also a facilitator covid has done something crazy right covid created the kind of situation in which uh, big tech went little mad but big tech went mad because governments not prodded them to do that. that that's the kind of prodding they wouldn't have taken otherwise i think the better example is the way they've handled donald trump for to have deplatformed him was a very very interesting thing because if you look at you know having read all these standards of free speech they are not able to prosecute trump because they can't find any kind of instructions by him to persons to walk into the 6th of january uh, to to commit the acts of 6th of january right so if he's not prosecutable then how did you remove him from a platform yep so in the donald trump deplatforming case it's a victory and defeat of free speech in a funny way right that a country like america could uh, deplatform a sitting president technically i know his term was ending at that time but he was still the president when he was deplatformed and secondly you have these platforms becoming mini monopolies and controlling thought after making people addicted to them so both are a good and bad comes out of it right yeah, well, i guess with everything but i uh, i i think mostly bad comes out of it i think mostly bad comes yeah, out of it i i as the reach of uh, these organizations is massive and they have created a political imbalance he doesn't his political rights are as impaired as anything you know at some point if they are going to be so pervasive in the field of free speech then public law remedies have to apply to them and maybe even the issuance of writs have to apply to them also another last point that i want to make and then maybe we'll wrap it up is that the issue of free speech actually is all about the individual primarily and in a society like india which is obsessed with group rights to be very honest we are a group rights obsessed society i'm not talking about what the constitution is leave that aside i'm talking about our samaj our samaj is all about group rights group sentiments group this group that in a country like that i don't think so we can ever have free speech simply because for you to have the concept of free speech you have to think from a point of view of an individual how, how about i give you a positive answer on this right when i read to you Did the american evolution of free speech it reached its highest standards in the 60s and in the 60s their per capita had risen a lot mm. so with prosperity you can always get that so basically with prosperity comes individualism with individualism comes the demand for free speech is what you're saying yeah that's pehle paise kamao all right you know what what we'll do is i'll read this paragraph in the end from this aereo magazine article it was titled answer to 12 bad anti free speech arguments featuring right so i loved this paragraph that was written in the end so this author says but before i conclude i want to highlight one last argument very briefly free speech is valuable first and foremost because without it there is no way to know the world as it is actually understanding human perceptions even incorrect ones is always of scientific or scholarly value and in a democracy it is essential to know what people really believe this is by pure informational theory of freedom of speech to think that without openness we can know what people really believe is not only hubris but magical thinking the process of coming to know the world as it is much more arduous is much more arduous than we usually appreciate it start with this recognize that you are probably wrong about any number of things exercise genuine curiosity about everything including each other and always remember that it is better to know the world as it really is and the process of finding that out never ends i thought this was a beautiful paragraph uh, what was the name of the author wait let me give the name of the author also kidhar gaya yaar naam nahi mere ko dikh raha hai iska um it was very well written i think it was uh, um covering many aspects it was written by greg lukianov i think he has co-written this uh, book with jonathan haidt uh, of called coddling the american mind so i guess we'll 
end on that and as always nikhil thanks for coming i i hope we have sufficiently annoyed indians and if we have not i'm really sorry about that no i don't know i don't think it's about a noise firstly thank you for having me this was a very interesting topic and i think uh, you know i i never walk away from these podcasts entirely satisfied with the way they've gone but i think today that main thematic point that i've made i think that is a novel point i don't think you'll find that in too much writing anywhere <clears throat> and i don't think you'll find it explained with as much material as i as i tried to do it today uh maybe you know we can develop on that later and bear in mind at some point we should do a a, a podcast dedicated to hate speech because there's a lot of law coming around on that a lot of things happen karenge we'll do one on hate speech dedicated to hate speech i think because that is the most used and abused concept in india and i knew if we would have gone into hate speech we would have you know gone into one one hour and a half and i believe you know attention spans also matter in india i think 2 hours is stretching it so but maybe we can do one the best way to do that one is a is a debate format actually somebody who will attack hate speech and i'll i'll defend hate speech Hmm. You can think of it, but that's a that's a different conversation for us to have offline. I think. Yeah, we we'll figure it out. So okay, guys, we'll wrap today's discussion up. Uh, please follow Nikhil on Twitter, and uh, you can go and read his articles. He writes on and off. I mean, I I push him to write, but Besharam है, लिखता कम है. Uh, उसको कई बार threaten करना पड़ता है even podcast पे आने के लिए. But that's for a separate uh, day. Also. please support my podcast buy the charvak podcast merch i have a dedicated t-shirt on free speech so go to kushalmehra.com or kadak merch and buy the free speech t-shirt and tell all your friends how you how much you love free speech also subscribe to the channel like the video leave a comment and please become a member or you can become a patron on patreon or send your donations through upi by the way for all the members tomorrow is the ama at 7:30 am if you are a member you can see the post i will see you guys next week that is monday and if you are members i'll see you on the sunday sessions uh and we'll end it today bye bye